Welcome to the Higher Ground Calvary Chapel School of Ministry. We are still doing our module on the cults, and we have entitled this module Damned Deceptions. The reason that we've done this is because the cults are Satan's counterfeit church. You think you're involved in a church, you think you are saved, and you think that you're a Christian, but you have been deceived. These deceptions are very, very dangerous and very serious. What happens is that people in the cults believe that they are saved. They've already taken care of the problem or that they're already in the process of taking care of this problem. And so whenever we try to share the gospel with them, whenever somebody starts talking about the plan of salvation, they tune out because, oh, I've already taken care of that. In reality, they have not. And they go through life completely deceived, thinking they've taken care of the problem of their eternity, and they have not. And so when they die, they discover at that point that they have been deceived and because they have been deceived, they are now damned for all eternity. So, we are talking about the damned deceptions of the cult and of Satan. We're in class number five, and we're discussing the crucifixion and the resurrection. So, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, just be here with us. Father, just be with those that are online, and Father, I pray that you would open their eyes, open their ears, open their minds, Father, so that they can open their hearts to you. Father, if there's anyone watching on this video that is in these deceptions, I pray that you would speak to them, that you would open their eyes and you would draw them out of the deceptions and into your truth and into your life. Now, bind the powers of the enemy, let them have no power, authority, influence over this class over this recording over this message use it for your honor and for your glory and this we ask in jesus name amen so i mentioned before not just in this module but in a lot of modules that the bible is actually a legally binding contract between god and between us his creation now, there are certain features of a legal contract, and those features are that each party has an obligation. One party is offering something to another. In this case, God is offering salvation. And so, as he is offering salvation, there are obligations on his part to provide that salvation, and there are obligations on our part as to how to obtain salvation that salvation. So, let's take a look at three of the four obligations that God has under his contract. The first is the incarnation. God is required to send the Messiah into this world. There is the crucifixion. The Messiah is to offer himself as a sacrifice for sins according to the law of Moses. And then the third is the resurrection. In this case, Jesus, or the Messiah, will return from the grave. So these are the three obligations, are the very things that the cults attack. The fourth obligation, which I did not mention, but just for information's sake, is that God will give us a home in heaven forever. Now, that fulfillment is outside of our world. It's outside of our dimension. So we can't prove that in this life. But these three obligations took place in this world. They are historical events. And so we can point to them and say, this happened. So yes, God fulfilled these three obligations. And because he fulfill these three obligations, we can have faith He's going to take care of the fourth one. So again, these three obligations are the very things that the cults attack. The incarnation was Jesus born into the human race. Uh, some of the 
cults, specifically the Jehovah Witnesses, talk about Jesus not really being Jesus, the Son of God, but they suggest that he is one of God's angels, that this angel assumed human form. The crucifixion. Did Jesus really die for our sins? Or did he die for just the original sin? Or did he die for some other reason and sin is still unresolved? And then the last one, did Jesus come back to life in the body he died in? Not that he came back to life. He has to come back to life in the physical body that he lived in and that he died in. So in our session before last, we were exploring the incarnation. We established why Jesus had to be God in human form. Under the law of the kinsman redeemer, he must be related to us by birth. We also went into detail with regards to the virgin birth, specifically with the teachings of the Latter-day Saints. The Latter-day Saints teach that God the Father has a physical body of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood, flesh and bone. And they teach that he came to earth and he had physical sexual relations with Mary and conceived Jesus. And they get around the idea of the virgin by saying, oh, virgin means anybody who's had sex with a human man. And God is not a human man, therefore she's still a virgin by their definition. As we review the teachings of the cults on this topic, we begin to notice that their teachings are not close to the Bible's teachings. So today we're going to combine the other two legal obligations and we're going to look at the crucifixion and we're going to examine the resurrection. Now, these two legal obligations on the part are very closely connected. Because you have one, it leads to the other. Now in our next session, we're going to be discussing the end results of God's fulfilling these three legal obligations. We're going to be talking about salvation, which is the fourth promise in heaven that he will save us and he will take us to live with him forever in heaven when we die. So I'm going to point out that when we discuss the crucifixion, there are going to be several points where the crucifixion and the plan of salvation overlap. It's going to be very hard to discuss one without touching on the other. So I'm going to start with the crucifixion. And I wanted to discuss the Latter-day Saints position on the crucifixion but there's an interesting thing when I began to do the research I ran into a serious problem for all intents and purposes the things that the founding fathers of the Mormon Church the Latter-day Saints were saying sounded just like the things that we as Christians say concerning the crucifixion Let's go back to the very beginning, to the founder of the Latter-day Saints Church, Joseph Smith. He said, the Savior is identified as having been, quote, crucified for the sins of the world, close quote. We find this in Doctrines and Covenants 53.2. Now, the next president, the President Brigham Young, taught that salvation was only, quote, through the name and the ministry of Jesus Christ and the atonement he made on Mount Calvary. Young made this statement in Journals and Discourse uh, basically back in 1862. So this is at the beginning, at the founding and the forming of the Latter-day Saints Church. And again, if I was talking to one of them and they used this reference to me, i go, yeah, that's right. Jesus died for the sins of the world. It's only through the ministry of Jesus and his atonement on Calvary that we have salvation. 
Well, let's go on. President John Taylor said that Christ was, quote, crucified and put to death to atone for the sins of the world. He made this statement in Journals and Discourse 25177 back in May of 1884. Now, as we're going forward, we're going to start paying attention to some dates. We then have President Wilfred Woodruff stating that, quote, the Lord Jesus was crucified on Mount Calvary for the sins of the world. And he made this statement in Journals of Discourse 157 in 1872. President Lorenzo Snow taught that Christ, quote, sacrificed his life on Mount Calvary for the salvation of the human family, close quote. And Snow made this to the Millennial Star, 56, uh, back in 1849, page 450. So we're now into the 19th century. In 1918, President Joseph F. Smith wrote, quote, Redemption has been wrought through the sacrifice of the Son of God upon the cross. Doctrines and Covenants 138-35. President Herbert J. Grant testified that Christ, quote, came to this earth with a divine mission to die upon the cross as the redeemer of mankind, atoning for the sins of the world. That sounds very precise. That sounds very correct. That sounds like something we would be teaching and sharing as we were witnessing to somebody. And Grant made this at the 111th Annual Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And he did this back in 1941. Every president of the church has testified that Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of the world. So at the start of the 21st century, the United First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, which are the leadership of the Latter-day Saint Church, proclaimed that Christ was, quote, sentenced to die on Calvary's cross. He gave his life to atone for the sins of mankind. We find this quote from the living Christ, the testimony of the apostles in January of 2000. Now there's some things that we can find in the Book of Mormon, where the Book of Mormon teaches the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, when Nephi had a vision, Nephi saw Christ, quote, lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. First Nephi 11.33. Now, Samuel the Lamanite also made comments, and he stated, surely, Christ surely must die that salvation may come. And that's Helaman 14:15. Doctors and Covenants says, quote, Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world, yea, for the remission of sins. Doctrines and Covenants 21, 9. In the book of the Pearl of Great Price, this speaks of Christ being, quote, lifted up on the cross, close quote, for the redemption of the world, Book of Moses, 7.55. In his own accounts of the atonement contained in Scripture, Jesus also emphasizes his crucifixion. Now, when Joseph Smith decided it was time to get religious, he started praying to God, and it's amazing how God always answered him in a way that was verbal and auditory and he could hear exactly what God was saying. He asked God, which of these churches do you want me to join? And God said, oh no, I don't want you joining any of those churches. All of the churches are corrupt. I want you to start a brand new church. 
which is how the, the Latter-day Saints Church began. Well, I have to ask this question. I ask lots of questions. I'm sorry. It's just what I do. If Jesus comes back, and that's what we're going to see right here, that he's going to come back to, both, to the people living in the new world before the new world was discovered. If Jesus is going to come back to this earth and set things straight, why didn't he come back to his church? He gave his life to give birth to this church. And if you follow the teachings, the church is the bride of Christ. Is he just abandoning his bride? Is he not more faithful to his bride than when she has a problem? He says, oh, I'm done with you. And he goes off to find a new bride. What kind of a husband would he make if that's what he's doing? But why didn't Jesus just come back to Europe or the Middle East? And why didn't he address them and say, hey, guys, here's what you're doing wrong. And here's how we're going to correct it. Now let me point something out to you. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and chapters 3, that is exactly what Jesus was doing to the Apostle John. He says, under the church of Philadelphia, under the church of Ephesus, under the church of Smyrna, and Jesus identified what they were doing right. He identified what they were doing wrong and how they could fix it. Why didn't Jesus do that with the church rather than going over to the new world and starting the church all over again? So Christ made his crucifixion central when he appeared to people living in the New World, according to the Book of Mormon. After he descended from heaven, he told the people, Come forth unto me, that you may thrust your hands into my side, and also you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that you may know that I have been slain for the sins of the world. And again, this is from the third book of Nephi, 3 Nephi 11.14. He defined the gospel in part by saying, My Father sent me that I might be lifted up on the cross, indicating that the crucifixion is a central part of his gospel. Again, third Nephi, this time from 27.13. So I just want to note that I went to these passages, just to double check, and these are the speakings of Jesus. He is talking about dying on the cross. However, they do not speak of why Jesus died on the cross, nor do they provide how salvation was made available to the world. And an interesting thing, they do not define what salvation Means. And this is going to be key to our lesson later in this class. On the surface, it looks like we're teaching and believing the same thing. So, what's the problem? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. These quotes came from a Latter day Saints article. The title of the article is a little bit lengthy The Teachings of Church Leaders Regarding the Crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they did a survey and studied all the church leaders and what they said from 1852 through 2018. That is a lot of data to go through. Now they had three people that were doing this. We had John Hilton III. We have Emily K. Hyde. And the last one is McKenna Grace Trussell. I pulled up this article as part of my research on the Latter-day Saints and what they teach on the crucifixion. Now the statement was, from the beginnings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ has been the heart of its theology. I'm going to challenge that using your own document. 
but they're making this statement and there's always this argument when you're doing a debate if you accept the premise that the other side gives you're going to have to accept their conclusion and so right now they are giving us the premise that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has made the crucifixion of Jesus Christ the heart of its theology I'm going to challenge that no it is not it may sound like it it may look like it they may think that it is but as we get into the rest of the doctrines they are teaching we're going to find that the crucifixion of Jesus has absolutely nothing to do with being forgiven of your personal sins when I finished my study I discovered that the basis for this belief was really about how many times certain words were used by the church leaders the authors had performed a digital word search now I love this every one of their documents has been put together in a word or uh, PowerPoint or uh, PDF format where they can do a digital word search so this is what they did they sat down and they put in the following words into all of the documents of the Latter-day Saint Church let's go look for crucify crucifixion cross Golgotha die death sacrifice and lift it up pretty good choice of words to work with should give you a pretty good idea now within our search 332 speakers referenced the death of Christ a total of 3377 times between 1852 and 2018 looks impressive but they did one subtle thing they left out the context 332 speakers out of how many speakers if we're talking about everybody that was speaking on behalf of the Latter-day Saint Church from 1852 through 2018 I would put this easily between four to five thousand people were probably various speakers I mean even if it was just a thousand speakers this is one-third of the time you're only talking about the death of the Christ one-third of the time or if it's 2,000 it's one-sixth of the time or if it's 3,000 you know it's one ninth of the time ah uh, if this is the central doctrine that you are teaching why haven't more people talked about it and it was mentioned a total of 3,377 times over this period of over a hundred years you know from 1852 to 1952 that's a hundred years you had another 50 years that's a hundred and fifty years had another 10 and 160 years it's only been mentioned 3,377 times in a hundred and sixty year time frame only 332 people mentioned it in 160 years how can you say that this is core to your theological belief if you don't talk about it more if you are sharing your belief you are bringing up your core statement I mean blunt I probably have mentioned the death the crucifixion the resurrection the atonement salvation in my life which is only 70 years and I've only been doing this for 50 years at least three to four thousand times you can look at my life and you look at my teaching and you're going oh yeah crucifixion resurrection atonement death on the cross shed blood that is a key belief in Dennis's life so this is out of context because we don't know how many potential speakers they were we do know interestingly enough that during conventions they counted the number of words and we'll be looking at that slide in a few minutes we're talking over a million words 
spoken in conference. A million, and they only used it 3,377 times over the entire 160 year period. It is not core to their doctrines or belief. Now the three speakers who referenced the crucifixion most frequently were, and before I go on, let me just point out, I would strongly suspect that the one who would speak about Jesus and his crucifixion and his atonement would be Joseph Smith. He was the founder of the Mormon faith. He was the forerunner. He would be out there teaching what they believed to all the non-Mormons. So if you're building your church, you should be presenting your key doctrine up front. So I would strongly suspect, if that is the case, that if crucifixion and salvation is the key message of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith would be the first one to teach it. So let's look. The first one, highest user, was Elder Orson Pratt. And he only did it 124 times. I do that probably in one module, six weeks. How long was Orson Pratt an elder? Number of years. And so we start bringing this down, he's probably saying it less than once a month, if we're just being conservative. After him came Elder Charles Penrose. He said it 93 times. Only 93 times when he taught or spoke during that time frame? President Thomas S. Monson only mentioned it 90. Why don't we see Joseph Smith up here? Why don't we see Brigham Young up here? Because they did not teach the crucifixion. They did not teach the atonement. They did not teach salvation through Jesus Christ, at least not salvation as we understand it. Trying to make it look like they were very mainline, these three authors through their research have actually done just the opposite. Their founding fathers didn't bother talking about the crucifixion. They basically used that phrase, they used that term, but it was not central or core to their beliefs. Now this chart shows, and again I don't have the chart here, it's a big chart, and, but it's online, it's there with that uh, title of the article. If you want to go online and find it, you can find the chart. But the chart they have shows that the overall discussion of the crucifixion has generally increased over time. If this is you starting your church, and teaching people what you believe, wouldn't the teachings of the church in its early years be the one to mention the core doctrines the most? It wasn't until the 1960s, almost a hundred years later, 80 years after the church starts, they finally get into it and start talking about the crucifixion. Why? Well, I have a theory. Jesus told us that these are wolves in sheep's clothing. And I would say that is true of the founding fathers. They knew the truth. They knew where their doctrines came from. They knew what their doctrines meant. And so I would put them up front as sheep that are wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, Satan is deceiving these people. And as you move away from the founding fathers, I'm going to identify the sheep, i.e. the wolves in sheep clothing in the Latter-day Saints and in the Jehovah Witnesses and other, found, other cults. They're the victims. Don't get angry at them for teaching what they're teaching because they've been taught wrong and they believe wrong. 
have pity on them, don't endorse it, don't acknowledge it, and don't accept it, but they think that they are sheep. They have been pretending to be sheep their whole spiritual life. And so they think they are sheep, and they think this is how sheep act, and Satan has gotten very good at disguising them as sheep. And I think it really came to light in the 1960s. You know, several generations had passed, and all the scandals at the beginning of the Mormon church, all the obvious deception has been lost or forgotten or hidden. And so I believe that in the 1960s, the sheep, the wolves in the sheep clothing, that were in the Latter-day Saints church, honestly and sincerely believed that they were sheep. And they believed what they had heard about Jesus saving them. Well, in the 1960s, actually the last part of the 1960s, God started the Jesus People movement. And there was a massive revival. And all the churches kept trying to jump on the bandwagon. So it would not be unlikely for the Latter-day Saint Church to start you know, teaching and presenting a similar message to get people to come to their church. So again, that's why I think this increased to its highest point in the 1960s. Now, ironically, the 1890s, which is the decade after the church started. Remember those statements were in the 1880s? So in the 1890s, after the church is getting up and running, nobody is talking about the crucifixion. Nobody is talking about the atonement of Jesus. So 1960s up here, 1890s down here. There's a peak, and it dies out. Now I want to show you how subtle these three authors are, because their documents, their numbers, are proving just the opposite of what they want to prove that the crucifixion is not central to their theology. But this was their task, this was their goal, was to prove the Mormons taught the crucifixion and it was a core doctrine in their beliefs. <clears throat> so now, they gotta play with statistics. Statistics are not proving what they need them to prove. They note, wow, look at this. There were 1,728,512 words spoken in the General Conference in the 1960s. Whew. I'm glad this was all done by a word search and nobody had to sit there and count them out themselves. 1,728,000 512 words spoken in the general conference. Well, again, what were those other words talking about? What were they using? What were they saying? And then when they look at the 1980s, oh look, we only spoke 1,337,000. So they're 400,000 words short in the 1980s. Did they have the same number of conferences during that time? Were the conferences the same length of time? So again, they're pulling stats out without showing us how they fit into the norm. But they did this for a reason, to account for this variance in words spoken per decade, we created a second chart normalizing the occurrences. In other words, we're going to take this peak and we're going to present it to you in such a way that it looks like it's not just 
this peak, but that everybody else is doing it. Let's average it out. Let's beat the peak down and it lifts everything up. You're playing with statistics. You're misrepresenting the facts. The facts clearly show that Jesus' crucifixion is not a core doctrine for the Latter-day Saints, no matter what they say. We created a second chart normalizing the occurrences of the words such as crucifixion and the other words described in our methodology to the total number of words spoken in each decade. When you normalize it, oh, look at that. The 1980s, which used to be the least, is now bumped up to saying it more often than the peak. Does that concern anybody else? Doesn't that sound like deception at its best? To take what a statistic represents and adjust that statistic so it will say just the opposite? That's what they've done here. Despite these differences, the charts are remarkably similar. No, they aren't. Both show a general increase in the overall discussion of Christ's crucifixion with similar trends over the time. Again, why wasn't the peak during the early years of the Latter-day Saints? When you are introducing your religion is when you explain your doctrines the most often and in the most detail for those who are going to be coming and joining your church. Again, this was their entire proof. The number of times each word was used. There's no analysis of how these words were used. There's no context to understand what they meant as they spoke these words. All we know is that these words were spoken a certain number of times. And that is not a very convincing argument. We learn from just a general review of lessons that the Latter-day Saints are quick to quote from the Bible. For those who have their mission, and these are the young men that are out there on their bicycles and ties and short sleeve shirts, they have a manual of what they're supposed to say each time they come into somebody. They memorize this manual. And I love the manual because at one point, this one Mormon missionary is supposed to say this, and the other Mormon missionary is supposed to, quote, respond spontaneously. It's a scripted presentation, but he's supposed to be spontaneous. They select the Bible verses they want, and they focus on those Bible verses, and they do not focus on the Bible as a whole. We will learn when we get to the topic on the uh, priesthood of the believer. The Mormons will accept the King James Bible, quote, as correctly interpreted, close quote. What does that mean? When the verse has been twisted and redefined to teach what the Mormons want it to teach, then they will accept it. And they claim they have the priesthood, and as the priesthood, they have the right to interpret, but you do not. So, many passages in their document are taken directly out of the Bible. When we talk about the book of Abraham, it is the first and second chapter of Genesis, and the main difference is the word God is replaced with the word gods. They lift out whole sections out of the Bible, put it into the Book of Mormon, put it into Doctrines and Covenants, and they alter it for their personal use with their beliefs. It's not enough to mimic words. You have to know what these words mean. My late wife loved birds. We had two or three birds. We had one that could actually talk. 
and she would love the fact the bird would talk. Now she would be putting the cover over the cage at night. They go, good night, pretty bird. And she'd say, good night, pretty bird. And whenever the bird and I would start to argue or fight, the bird would say, turkey. And he would call me a turkey. Now I did not take personal offense because they have to know what these words mean. And if you're speaking a word without knowing what it's meaning, all you're doing is mimicking. Because Bev would fight with the bird and play with the bird and say turkey to the bird all over. If you don't know what you're saying, all you're doing is making noise. It might be noise that you recognize as something else, but that is not what the person is actually saying. They are only recreating that noise. The leaders of the Latter-day Saints use the terminology. Remember, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They believe that they are sheep when they are not. They have been deceived. They've been deceived with the damned deceptions. When I studied under the late Dr. Walter Martin and took his class on the cults, one of his lessons stressed the importance of defining the terms and what the words mean to the cults. They say the same words, but they mean something completely different. Oh, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Of course I believe in Jesus Christ. All right, brother. We believe that Jesus Christ is God. We believe he is the third person of the Trinity. We believe he is that part of God that was born into the human race, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, and rose from the dead. To one cult, Jesus is a God. To that same cult, he is an angel in human form, but he is not God. Another one, he is a spirit child. That when God and his heavenly wife were having sex, they produced Jesus as a spirit child up in the heavenlies. He is the brother of Lucifer, who is also a spirit child. He is a created being, not the creator. So when you say, hey, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Oh yes, I believe in Jesus. Which Jesus are we talking about? Which Jesus do you believe? You can use the same sounds, but make sure you're meaning the same thing. The article stressed that there was a major ongoing debate among the members of the Latter-day Saint Church as to when Jesus actually obtained salvation. There was one side that held that it was the agony Jesus felt in the Garden of Gethsemane that obtained the salvation. He was sweating drops of blood. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. That agony and that surrender is what they're teaching but our salvation with this group. The other group is saying, hey, it was his agony on the cross that obtained salvation. Think about that. The Bible does not teach that it was Jesus' agony that brought our salvation. It wasn't how much he suffered. It wasn't how much pain he was in. It wasn't how hard he struggled it was his death. It was the shedding of his blood that bought forgiveness for sins. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Not without agony, there's no remission. Without the shedding of blood. It's clear that the Mormon leaders do not even understand what Jesus was doing on the cross. They have no clue 
as to how this worked. They're doing nothing more than repeating what they hear other Christians say, and they don't understand the difference. Now I'm going to start quoting Dr. Walter Martin. Dr. Walter Martin was considered the expert on the cults when he was alive. He passed away uh, back, I think it was in the 1980s, the 1990s. His book is The Kingdom of the Cults. And it was a textbook that every class on the cults used for several decades. Quote, The savior of Mormonism, however, is an entirely different person as their official publications clearly reveal. The Mormon Savior is not the second person of the Christian Trinity. Since as we have previously seen, Mormons reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, and he is not even a careful replica of the New Testament Redeemer. This is from Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin, published in 1965 and on page 192. Brigham Young categorically stated that the sacrifice made upon the cross by Jesus Christ in the form of his own blood was, notice this word, ineffective for the cleansing of some sins. Brigham Young went on to teach the now suppressed but never officially repudiated doctrine of blood atonement. I understand that in the state of Utah, capital punishment is in the form of a firing squad. Why? Because of this doctrine of blood atonement. People still believe it, they'll still talk about it, but it became controversial. And so they don't endorse it openly, they don't teach it openly. What Brigham Young was saying is that Jesus paid for some sins, specifically the original sin of Adam. But he teaches he's not paying for your sins personally. You're not saved. You're not saved. You're not saved. You're definitely not saved. And you're not saved. So the only way that blood can cleanse your sins is if you personally shed your blood. The gas chamber does not shed blood. Electric chair does not shed blood. Hanging does not shed blood. Firing squad sheds the blood. That's why they have that as the execution. So as you execute this person, their blood is being shed, and that should take care of the sins in their life that Jesus could not. The shedding of Jesus' blood is ineffective. Now you understand why the preaching of the crucifixion and the shedding of blood on the cross is not a core doctrine among the Mormons. This is Brigham Young just after Joseph Smith back at the beginning of the founding of the Latter-day Saints church. Again, from Kingdom of the Cults, this case, page 192. There is not a man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. Your sin is a violation of a covenant you made with God. And God is going to hold you personally responsible and personally accountable according to the Latter-day Saints. The blood of Christ will never, it's a powerful word, never wipe out those violations of the contract. Your own blood must atone for it. Again, Kingdom of the Cults. Well, this is some um, Brigham Young's Doctors and Discourse. Uh, in four, let's see, three, two forty-seven, four, two nineteen, through two twenty, and Dr. Martin was quoting exactly from what Brigham Young said. 
Now, there is this doctrine in the Latter-day Saint Church that any president is speaking on behalf of God. And whatever the president says is just as if God said it to us. Brigham Young was speaking as the president. Therefore, it's as if God was telling us this. Young's statement declared that what Christ's blood could not cleanse, a man's own blood atonement could. And again, Kingdom of the Copes, page 193. Your blood is more effective than Jesus' blood. Your blood as a fallen, sinful person is more effective at removing sin than the blood of Jesus Christ born of a virgin without sin, without the original sin, and having lived a life of never committing sin is less effective than yours. Stop and think about that. Now we bring in our good friend again, Bruce McConkie. He is the apologetics for the Latter-day Saint Church back during the 1960s and 70s. Grace is simply the mercy, the love, and the condescension God has for his children, as a result of which he has ordained the plan of salvation so that they may have power to progress and become like him. What? McConkie again back in 1973. What the Mormons think of Christ. God's Grace is just mercy that God is going to allow you to be able to progress and become your own God. That is their definition of grace. Notice how he now points this out to us. All men are saved by grace alone. Oh, that sounds so good. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. All men are saved by grace alone. Yeah. Without any act on their part. True. Meaning that they are resurrected and become immortal because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Again, our friend Bruce McConkie. What they think of Christ, pages 27 to 33. In other words, Jesus' death on the cross has nothing to do with sin. Brigham Young said his blood was ineffective from removing your sins. So here McConkie is saying the only thing the death of Jesus does is to allow you to become resurrected in the afterlife. We're going to see later that this resurrecting is an automatic thing for everybody. And the death of Jesus does not determine where you resurrect. You have the terrestrial kingdom, where according to them all of us non-Mormon believers get to go. You have the telestial kingdom, which is where you're punished. Then you have the celestial kingdom. And even in the celestial kingdom, there are three levels. And that's where you work your way to godhood if you are in compliance with all the requirements of the Latter-day Saint Church. You are still working to get there after your death. Hence, Nephi was led to write, and he's quoting from the book of Nephi, we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren to believe in Christ, and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved. He should have stopped there. After all we can do. Grace is the safety net. You are required to do everything that you are required to do. In other words, you are required to work 
your way to heaven. Ephesians 2 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, this is pages 27 through 33. So, according to Mormon doctrines, Jesus did die on the cross, but it's not clear if salvation was obtained by his suffering in the garden or if salvation came by his suffering on the cross. This suggests that salvation was attained from his agony not from the shedding of his blood or dying. The Mormons use the word salvation. Jesus attained salvation, but they define salvation as a universal resurrection for all mankind. Most adults will go to the telestial kingdom, which is composed of the endless hosts of people of all ages who have lived their lives after the manner of the world who have been carnal sensual and devilish who have chosen the vain philosophies of the world rather than accept the testimony of Jesus they have been liars and thieves and sorcerers and adulterers blasphemers and murderers Mormon doctrine by Bruce McConkie 1966, page 778. The second kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, will be inhabited by Christians Ta-da! who did not accept the Mormon message. Mormons who did not live up to their church's requirements and men of goodwill of other religions who rejected the revelations of the Latter-day Saints. Mormon Doctrines, McConkie, 1966, page 778. I had a friend in junior high school that I would spend the afternoons after school with. He was a Latter-day Saint, and he was trying to explain this to me. He was saying, oh yeah, you're going to be in the second kingdom. You're going to be our servants, and you're going to be our slaves, and you're going to be taking care of us through all eternity. And I'm like, where did you get this concept? Right here, from the Mormon Doctrines. The highest, or the celestial heaven, is itself divided into three levels. Only in this highest level is godhood, or the possession of a kingdom for oneself and one's family to be gained. This particular estate has as its prerequisite the candidates have been sealed by celestial marriage in a Mormon temple while upon the earth. If you're not married, you ain't going. This is why the Mormons will have celestial or spiritual marriages in order to have a spiritual wife for somebody who died without being married. We're going to be discussing the salvation, plan of salvation next session. And they have seven things that they list, and one of these is you must be a Mormon, you have to be married in the Mormon church, and you have to be baptized in the Mormon church. There are seven things they talk about, and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is not listed anywhere in this. Now the sad thing is they keep their believers ignorant of the true teachings. As you move up in the church, that's when they start teaching you these doctrines. If you try to share this information with a everyday, run-of-the-mill, Latter-day Saint, they're going to say, oh no, that's not true. That's lies. We don't believe that. And maybe at their level they don't. Which is a point of hope that maybe at their level they really are believing that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And maybe they really have asked Him to be their Savior. In that case, the deception did not work and they did make it in to the kingdom. Even in the celestial kingdom, godhood is by slow progression. And in the end, each who becomes a god will, with his family, rule and populate a separate planet of his own. Does that sound like the heaven mentioned in the Bible? As noted, the Mormon teachings 
There are three kingdoms in the afterlife. For the Mormon, salvation is resurrection. All mankind will be resurrected into one of these three kingdoms. They will be resurrected no matter what they do. Salvation slash resurrection is not based upon works. Resurrection for all was secured by Jesus' death on the cross, but Jesus' salvation has no influence on which kingdom you're going to be resurrecting into. That falls to you as an individual. What determines which kingdom you spend eternity in is determined on your works. Latter-day Saint Church is a works-oriented religion. Again, I want to bring back Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. Not of yourselves means you're not the one who obtained it. You're not the one who did it. It is the gift of God. This is the Bible version. Compare this to Nephi. For we know it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Book of Mormon. 2nd Nephi 10.24 It is not the death of Jesus on the cross that saves them. The death of Jesus on the cross will cause all mankind to be resurrected, but his blood does not remove sins. We must live a good life and shed our own blood if necessary. Now it's interesting that in the Mormon doctrine, sin is not violating the laws of God. It only counts if you knew you were doing it. It only counts if you did it for the wrong reason. And so in their theology, they can do things that we would qualify as a sin, but if they didn't know it was a sin, they're not responsible. If they were doing it for some other reason, then it's not a sin and they don't have to deal with it. But if they do sin, and they do something that they should not have done, and they knew they shouldn't have done it, and they did it for the wrong reasons, then it's necessary for them to shed their own blood to move forward. So, as a final observation on the Latter-day Saints, I'm running a little bit late, but we're going to finish up anyhow. If the cross of Jesus is such an important point in their doctrines, why are there no crosses in the Latter-day Church? They have steeples. You can say, oh, it looks like a church. But there's not a cross anywhere in sight. So we have uh, this quote. Crosses are never used on any Mormon buildings. Strangely enough, Mormon leaders have often pointed to the Garden of Gethsemane as the place where Christ's atonement took place. This is a gentleman, uh, Bill McKeeves, Why No Crosses. This is the Mormon Research Ministry, and he did this in 2020. We have looked at the death of Jesus on the cross. What do the Latter day Saints teach about the resurrection? Well, there's not a lot of discussion on the teaching of the Latter-day Saints regarding resurrection because they do not see anything unique about his resurrection. They just note that he resurrected before they did. We're all going to resurrect. We're all going to go into this alternate reality of the telestial, terrestrial, or celestial kingdoms. Every man who is eventually made perfect raised from the dead and filled or quickened with the fullness of celestial glory will become like them, the Father and the Son, in every respect, physically and intelligent attributes and powers. This is done by Parley P. Pratt, key to the science of theology back in 1855. This is not a new teaching for them. So what about the Jehovah Witnesses and the crucifixion? The atonement is a ransom paid to Jehovah God by Christ Jesus and is applicable to all who accept it in righteousness. 
Sounds okay so far. Even sounds biblical. In brief, the death of Jesus removed the effects of Adam's sin off his offspring. Removed the effects of Adam's sin, i.e. the original sin, and it lays the foundation of the new world of righteousness. This came from the Jehovah of the Watchtower. Martin and Clan did this, 1963. Go to page 30. That which is redeemed or bought back is what was lost, namely perfect human life. This is a thing from the Watchtower. Let God be true. 1946, page 114. When dealing with the Jehovah Witnesses, we need to address their concept of the soul, death, heaven, and hell. They do not believe that the soul is immortal. In fact, they claim the fact that the human soul is mortal can be amply proven by a careful study of scripture. It is amazing how many false doctrines come out of the cults after a, quote, careful study of scripture. Remember I mentioned how they took the statistics and you had this peak for how many times they talked about the crucifixion and using their statistics and twisting and distorting, they made it say just the opposite that is what a careful study of scripture seems to be with the cults. They do not take it at face value. They try to redefine terms. They twist things and take them out of their context and they ignore what the rest of the Bible is saying. Here it is. God's word, Ezekiel 18.44, they claim, proves the soul is not immortal. Because all souls are mine. The soul that sins, it is shall die again let God be true let the Jehovah Witnesses be true for exchange and the idea is to say that something that is immortal cannot die again when a soul dies it has been dying its entire existence it's when we ask Jesus to be our Savior it's when he quickens our soul which means he brings it to life and now our soul is alive which is why he says you must be born again your soul is always dying if you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior and they're saying that proves it doesn't exist it exists and it will be dying through all eternity if you do not accept the offer of Jesus Christ to save you. Thus we see that the claim that man has an immortal soul and therefore differs from the beast is not scriptural. Really? We're the same as the animals in their doctrine. Let God be true, pages 59 through 60. It is clearly seen that even the man Christ Jesus was mortal. He was in a mortal body. That is not the same thing as his soul being mortal. He did not have an immortal soul. Jesus, the human soul, died. Again, they just don't understand what happened on the cross. Let God be true. So what happens to the soul at the point of death? Because the soul is not immortal, and this is the Jehovah Witnesses' premise, which I am rejecting, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that the soul ceases to be. They call it annihilation. And it remains annihilated until the kingdom age. Let me just point out something to you. They do not believe that their bodies will be resurrected. When they're gone, they're gone. And they decay and they are no more. They believe that who they are, their intellect or soul as we call it, 
is annihilated at death. Nothing left. There's nothing there. So, when this kingdom age comes, they teach God is going to make you a brand new body, looking just like the body you have now. But it is a different body. It is not your body. It is a copy that looks like you. And when it comes to the ending the annihilation, God has to remake you and put you in this counterfeit body. So you spend your entire life living a righteous life and doing many good deeds and working for your salvation. And when you die, it's gone. But when they do have the kingdom age, something that looks like you and thinks like you and has your memories is going to be allowed to enjoy the work of your labor. That's what they're teaching. Their idea concerning hell is that it doesn't exist. Gone. Don't have to deal with that. It doesn't get there. As if they have the authority to nullify what God has ordained. As such, the unqualified remain annihilated forever. Well, where is the problem in that? I mean, why are we so determined to get people to be saved if they die and that's it and they don't even know they're dead? They don't know they're not in the kingdom age. They don't realize that they're not existing anymore. What's the problem? People would be happy if that was the end of their life just to cease and not even be aware of it and not even to know about it and not to have to worry about it anymore. They believe that hell does not exist simply because it is too terrible to consider anybody being sent there. That is why God is sending the message, I don't want to send you there. Here, here is my gift. Get saved. Don't make me do this. So we have them quoting again. It is so plain that Bible hell is the tomb or the grave that even an honest little child can understand it. Why can't they? But the religious theologians cannot. Came okay, back, let God be true, 1946, page 72 to 73. Imperfect man does not torture even a mad dog, but kills it. And yet clergymen attribute to God, who is love, the wicked crime of torturing human creatures merely because they had the misfortune of being born sinners. It's not because they were born sinners, it's because they did not accept his offer of salvation. Let God be true. Again, 1946, page 79. Their solution to sin and hell is to remove it from their theology. All they focus on is the original sin of Adam, which we inherit. The actions of Jesus on the cross is to pay for that and only that. To sacrifice something means to give it up. Hence, Jesus could not have that body back. What has religion done to mankind? Their religion has done a lot to confuse. This is in 1951, page 259. The Watchtower Society holds that all Jesus did on the cross was to offer a perfect human body of his own to replace the perfect human body of Adam that was lost when he sinned. If you do not understand the soul, if you do not accept the concept of a soul, all you have left is a body. It was not that Jesus was offering his body. He was shedding his blood and offering his life as a sacrifice to God. So there was nothing beyond this when it comes to the crucifixion. When it comes to the resurrection, they teach that Jesus could not reclaim his body and so therefore he was resurrected as a spirit. But wait a second. Didn't that spirit show up in the upper room 
didn't that spirit say here touch my body examine it realize that I am flesh and bone and Jesus went to great lengths that night to prove to them that he was not a spirit JW's claim that he resurrected as a spirit Almighty God raised his son Jesus Christ from the dead as an immortal spirit person what has religion done for mankind religion has done a lot to mess up mankind we do not need religion we need relation with God Jehovah Witnesses are opposed to the cross and they claim it's a pagan symbol when somebody joins their church they must destroy any cross they have you cannot throw them away you can't give them away you have to physically destroy them what does the Bible have to say about this first Corinthians 1 18 for the preaching of the cross to those who perish is foolishness but unto us who are saved it is the power of God the Jehovah Witnesses are the ones who are perishing their faith will not save them therefore the cross is foolish to them and they want nothing to do with it however as believers the cross represents the very power of God it was on the cross that the power of sin was broken it is on the cross that we were brought bought with the price the price of Jesus's life it was on the cross that Satan went down in defeat is it any wonder that Satan wants nothing to do with the cross and that he has removed it from all of his false religions both the Latter-day Saint Church and the Jehovah Witnesses they insist that Jesus did not even die on a cross they basically claim that it's something called a torture stake or a torture stick now I came across a picture on the internet that I was wondering like wow that's weird and it's a picture of Jesus being crucified but in the picture it was a tree trunk it was still in the ground it still grew and whoever was doing it had cut all the limbs off and it was just the trunk of the tree and somebody had taken the hands of Jesus and stretched them up and nailed them to either side of the trunk and then they lifted his feet and nailed the ankles to either side of the trunk and he's hanging there on the trunk of the tree that is their idea of a torture stake or a torture stick and my thought is wow does that even make any difference Jesus died Jesus shed his blood that is the key and so I really was thinking why make a big deal about it why argue why try to refute this so normally I just say don't even bother let it go but as I was studying the law of Moses I found that hey it is a big deal after all see Jesus has to die and offer himself as sacrifice in accordance with the law of Moses so the altar was constructed to have four horns upon it there is one horn at each corner of the altar and these horns are part of the ceremony Exodus 29 12 and you take you shall take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with your finger you know, smear it all over that horn each of the four horns and when you're done you're going to pour out the blood beside the bottom of the altar so you have the blood that's left over that you've taken and you pour it out at the base we've noted that in order for Jesus to be our legal redeemer he has to fulfill the requirements of the laws of Moses this includes the law regarding the sacrifice on the day of atonement the high priest was required to change his clothes before performing the sacrifice his garments were given to him and they were called they were given for grace and beauty he was clothed with grace and beauty as he served and as he went about among the people but when it came time to do the sacrifice 
Here's the reference. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28.2. Leviticus 16.4. The high priest shall put on the holy linen coat. He's taken off the garments for beauty and for glory. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen miter he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. The high priest must put off glory and beauty, and he is to be dressed only in the linen, which is righteousness, per Revelation 19.8. And to the church was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The high priest removes the glory and beauty and appears in righteousness to perform the sacrifice on the day of atonement. Jesus set aside his glory and beauty when he left heaven. And when he hung on the cross, he was hanging there only in his righteousness the blood of the sacrifice must be poured out at the place the offering is made Jesus's side was pierced as he hung on the cross blood and water was poured out at the base of the cross just as it was required by the law of Moses so what about the blood on the horns of the altar the anointing of the blood on the horns of the altar sanctifies the altar it gives the altar the power to atone for sins. If you do not anoint the horns, the sacrifice is unacceptable. It's worthless. The blood is required to be placed on the horns of the altar in these passages. So just in case you think it was a one-time thing, Exodus 29, Leviticus 4, Leviticus 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, Leviticus 8, Leviticus 9, and Leviticus 16. Obviously, there's a reason you're anointing the horns of the altar with the blood of the sacrifice. Leviticus 18, 15, and here's Moses doing this. And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. Anointing the horns of the altar purifies the altar, making the offering acceptable to God. Keep in mind what God promised Moses. Exodus 6, 6. Wherefore says, say unto the children of Israel, this is God's words to Moses, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Notice the description, stretched out arm. Now I thought when I first read this, God's arm was stretched out like he had a sword ready to come down and deliver us. It was Pastor Bob Probert over at the Packing House in Redlands when I was taking his uh, classes, the home Bible study, and I mentioned this. He said, oh, no, no, no. The stretched out arms. On the cross, Christ's arms are stretched out. If Jesus were nailed to a torture stick, then his arms would have been stretched up not out. God promised to redeem us with arms that were stretched out, not arms that were stretched up. God pays attention to the details of his promises. The torture stick does not fulfill God's promise to Moses. So when were the four horns of the altar on the torture stick? There's only two. It's a stick. There's the top of the stick and there's the bottom of the stick. That's two horns at best, not four. 
So when Jesus was stretched out on the cross, the blood from his right hand stained the right side of the cross. It's a protrusion. It's sticking out. That's a horn. So the blood, when they nailed his left hand to the left side of the cross, stained the left side of the cross or stained the left horn. When they nailed his feet to the base of the cross, they were bleeding, and the blood from his feet stained the base of the cross, the third horn, or the bottom horn, and he had his brow and head torn from the crown of thorns. So when he put his head back, the blood from this wound stained the top of the cross, the top horn, the fourth horn. So all four points of the cross were stained and anointed with the blood of the sacrifice. It purified his altar so the sacrifice could be offered. This action purified the altar. It empowered the altar to receive the sacrifice for God. I believe it does make a difference under the law of Moses whether he died on a stake or died on a cross. So what about the resurrection? Jehovah Witnesses theology teaches that Jesus resurrected as a spirit, not the body he died in. They teach that during the three days he was in the tomb, he was annihilated. He just ceased to exist. If he could not resurrect in the body that held the sin, then how can we ever know that his sacrifice worked? The answer is we can't. When Jesus hung on the cross, all the sin of all the world, of all the ages, past, present, and future, filled him. When you have a sacrifice, you have to go to the sacrifice, you place your hands on the head of your sacrifice, and you confess your sins over, over the sacrifice, and in doing so, your sin is transferred to the sacrifice. If your sin is not transferred to the sacrifice, it does not atone anything. When Jesus hung on the cross for three hours, the world went dark. And Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God forsook Jesus on the cross. Because as Paul said, he was being made sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. And all the sin of all ages, of every person, was placed into Jesus. And he died. They put him in the grave. Now, if there was a single sin that was not atoned for in the grave, that sin can hold that body in the grave. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin, singular, is death. So, Jesus had to resurrect in the same body to show that these sins were in fact forgiven. They were atoned for. He had to come back in the same body that was filled with the sins and placed in the grave. Jesus knew a thousand years or so after his death and resurrection, probably two or three thousand years after, someone's going to come along and say, oh, his body did not resurrect. So Jesus made this a sign that he was God. John 2, 18 through 21. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign are you going to show us, seeing that you're doing these things? They confronted Jesus. We need to know that you're really of God. Give us a sign. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in the building, and you're going to rear it up in just three days? Yeah, right. 
but he spoke of the temple of his body. The people asked for a sign. Jesus gave them the sign. After you destroy the temple of my body, I will restore it in three days. This means bringing the body he was in when he made this claim back to life and continuing to live in it after his death. If Jesus cannot or did not do this, then he lied. If he lied, he was not sent by God. If he was not sent by God, guess what? We're still in our sins. Yes, it is that serious. It is that important. This is why Jesus appeared to his disciples. He appeared to those who knew him best. When he came into the room, they were afraid. They had no doubt about who he was. They recognized him. But it was not something, someone that they were looking to appear. They freaked out and they thought that it was his ghost. Spirit. Exactly as the Jehovah Witnesses are teaching. Jesus submitted to testing to prove that he was not a ghost. He ate the fish and the honeycomb to prove he was physical. He invited them to test his body, to examine it, to touch it, to feel it. Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. In fact, Jesus submitted to whatever test they would ask of him. He was trying to prove to them beyond any shadow of a doubt that this was his physical body that had been resurrected from the dead. You cannot touch a spirit. Now when Thomas missed the meeting, he demanded further proof. Jesus came back and submitted to Thomas's test. Whatever it took to prove to his disciples that he had resurrected from the dead in the body he had lived and died in was offered. And the Jehovah Witnesses come along 2,000 years later and say, oh, that's wrong. He really wasn't in a body. He was a spirit. Where is their proof? Now, notice the teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses. Only because Thomas would not believe did Jesus appear in a body like that in which he died. Paradise Lost to Paradise Regained, 1958, page 144. Wait a minute. Did they just say that Jesus conned his own disciples to get them to lie and tell an untruth? Yep. That's exactly what they just said. Jesus would not lie to his disciples. His disciples had to be 100% convinced that he had come back from the dead in order to convince us 2,000 years later. Each disciple was so convinced that each disciple, with the exception of Judas and John, died a painful death rather than change their testimony. Judas committed suicide and hung himself before Jesus was crucified. They did try to torture John. They put him into boiling oil and God protected him and he was not injured, just why he was on the Isle of Patmos. So in summary, Latter-day Saint Church, they accept the cross, they teach Jesus agonized to give them salvation, it took place either on, in the garden or on the cross, and they're not sure which. They define salvation as resurrection for all mankind, Everyone will resurrect without doing a single thing. That is what Jesus provided with his agony. Latter-day Church does not teach on the resurrection because it's unimportant to them. They will all resurrect. Jesus just beat them to it. JWs teach Jesus died on a torture stick. They teach the death replaced the corrupt body of Adam. And so he only paid for the original sin of Adam. They teach that he had to resurrect as a spirit because he had given his body to God and traded it for Adam's. Individual sin is something each person must avoid by being righteous himself. 
The Bible teaches something completely different from this. The Bible teaches that Jesus was God, become human, and was born into the human race. The Bible teaches Jesus died upon the cross to fulfill the law of Moses. This means that each aspect of Jesus' death had to correlate with each requirement under the law of Moses. In doing this, he paid for all the sins of all mankind. As John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is from John 1, 29. The resurrection is just as important to the Christian teaching as the crucifixion. Jesus assumed all sins for the entire world. He assumed all sins, past, present, and future. This is the only way he could die once for all. If he did not atone for all future sins, he would have to come back at a later date and atone for our future sins. If there was even one sin left in him after three days, that sin would have kept him in the grave. By resurrecting in the same body he died in, Jesus proved that the power of sin was broken forever. With the power of sin broken, the power of death is also broken. So when Jesus came back from the dead, in the same body he died in, it is proof to us that his sacrifice was accepted to God. His resurrection is proof that this worked. All of it worked. The power of sin was broken. The power of death was broken. And sin is no longer an issue between God and and us between God and me and God and you so next session we're going to be looking at the plan of salvation we're going to be comparing it to the plan of salvation offered by the Latter-day Saint Church and offered by the Jehovah Witnesses we're going to be looking at the true plan of salvation versus the alternative plan let's close in prayer Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Father, drive these words home to us. Let us see the distinct differences between what Satan is counterfeiting through his cults and what you are offering through your Son. Father, your word is truth. Your Son is truth. He offers the true salvation and not a counterfeit. He did everything that was required to be done in order that he can offer salvation to us free of charge, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Help us to see this, help us to realize the importance, and help those who hear this message make the decision to accept this free gift into their life. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen.